Hi to everyone. Uh, welcome to the second day of the first session of Cuba. Uh, I don't know if you are all ready, but we are already streaming. Uh, I think there is some people that they need to arrive still, but I think we are going to start uh, since the, the audience uh, on the other side, I think they are, they are expecting us. Um, so I want to welcome all of you uh, to the second day of the of the event. Uh, my name is Juan Chacon. I'm from the office Zuloark. Uh, Zuloark is a distributed office uh, in different countries in Europe. I'm based in Berlin. I'm on also uh, part um, of the Inteligente Colectivas Network uh, since its creation, 2010. Uh, uh, and then I want to, today, the day is going to be, uh, like we are going to transfer from the day of yesterday, uh, that it was more like the general context of Inteligentes Colectivas, like the first um, encounter with all the partners and supporters that we are starting this uh, this project together. Uh, and today we are moving to the, to the local specific context of Cuba. Uh, so the, the whole content of the day is going to be related uh, to that. Uh, but first, like to do this transition, I would love to talk about like how intelligent perspectives uh, is actually two things, or uh, is trying to to achieve two things. Uh, first of all, like the intelligent perspectives uh, is a network, uh, as we could say yesterday, is uh, a network uh, who everybody who is interested and have like a common interest can come together. Uh, to co-create and co-research uh, a local uh, a local specific place we are interested in with. This accessibility is done uh, through a website. So in the case of Cuba, uh, we are launching, this is still in development, uh, cuba.inteligenciascolectivas.org. I will be posting the link later uh, and you can see it in the, in the YouTube uh, uh, link. So this website, we are going to try uh, in the next weeks, like through all the partners, to create like this catalog of evidences, like similar uh, to the examples that we saw yesterday, but also a glossary. How are the terms that we are specifically using in this project in the context of Cuba? A map that connects all these evidence that they are not individual examples, but also they can be connected and we can understand the layers of how our cities or territories are working. Uh, and also a repository that will be like all the information that the people involved in the project will be sharing with each other uh, through a specific part of the website. And of course, uh, all the partners and all the people uh, inside the project, they will have a profile and they will have a website uh, where we will be able to see their contributions. This is the first part of Inteligentes Colectivas that is also applying to Cuba. And the second part that is important that we understand that was also uh, very detailed yesterday by Juanito from Soul House is that Inteligentes Colectivas is a methodology that helps us to co-research and co-create or territories, the territories that we uh, that we inhabit. So today, with these two big ideas, like our network in Cuba uh, and surroundings, because we are working like transnational and also this methodology, like we are going to go inside the Cuban context with some invites. So the first part of the day will be like 30 minutes, uh, where Lorenzo Garcia Andrade from Soul House will present some previous research done uh, last year in a 10 days uh, trip uh, in the city of La Habana in collaboration with Cujae and also with La Fabrica, with Guillén, uh, and some topics and some specific examples of things that are happening in La Habana that can kick off like a, a conversation. Uh, and afterwards, we will have like a panel uh, with uh, people that they were already yesterday, with Joyce Len, uh, with Fernando. Martirena Cordoyes from Infra Studio, from Infra Studio, sorry, from Robertico Ramos, uh, is a designer, a Cuban designer, uh, Michael Sánchez Torres from the Proyecto Acocan, or Ana Laura Escalona from Proyecto Acocan as well, and will be more moderated by Cuyen. 
And then after this conversation, we will open the conversation to the rest of the partners and also to the audience uh, through the chat in YouTube. And this uh, last part will be half an hour moderated uh, by Cristina Serifi and Guillem Barrera. Uh, so I will, uh, I want to thank like everybody participated in this event and in this project, like Sohaus, like the partners, Sohaus, TU Berlin, the Freie Universität, Kuhai and FAC. Uh, I want also to thank like uh, the partners, like the Berlin University Alliance, the Embassy of Spain, the Project of Click, that they are like uh, supporting and funding uh, these first steps of the project. Uh, and of course, like to the technical part, like uh, Peter and Rodrigo from both sides uh, of the Atlantic. And I want to give the voice to Lorenzo now uh, with two questions that they were in the air yesterday. And uh, I think it's nice that we remind them uh, all together for the discussion afterwards. Like one of the questions uh, from the audience was like how to maintain local and international networks and how to stay connected and continue building knowledge. That is something that's very relevant for us. And the other is like, in order to understand the collective intelligence in Cuba, we will carry out some field analysis so that, I, uh, that it can be appreciated how citizens approach creative solutions to daily problems. And under what criteria would one area or another be studied? So this is important for our panelists. Um, nevertheless, I'm gonna give the voice to Lorenzo and then I hope everybody enjoys this. Uh, this session. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, thank you, Juana, and thank you, um, and thank you, everyone else again, Guille and Peter, for holding this infrastructure, um, holding the infrastructure of the of the of the whole encounter. Nothing before before going. I think into I had thought that would be a bit interesting was. Um, Going a bit a step back, uh, a step back to the trip we did for ten days, which we called Phase Zero uh, or Phase One, uh, like a year ago, and it was it's to go back one more one more year, which is when we were doing this project, studying, uh, investigating. It was to an artistic approach. We were doing um, an investigation around. Um, Around barber shops in Cuba as social condensers. I mentioned it yesterday briefly. And well, the project was from the Ministry of Culture in Spain and in collaboration with Rode Quintero, a barber from Cuba, and Oscar, Oscar Mendia as well. And the thing with this, with the um, with the with, with this project was um trying trying to get uh, like learnings of a bro of the broader cuban society economy and social functioning through a specific space you know obviously the the learnings are marginal and limited but we did still find that there were a lot of things that were able to be condensed through through that so um, two years ago we went there i don't know if around 18 or 20 or 20 days, and throughout those days we visited, I don't know, like about 50 or 60 barber barber shops, and we made different agents there, and we were started to gather like an archive of sound, of materials, of interviews, and, um, and then throughout our time there we weren't very clear on how we were going to formalize the, the project, but after all these visits and seeing uh, and see and accumulating all this content and then reviewing it while we were there, we decided that the most that we felt that the most um, uh, the most uh, strict way to be able to transfer the knowledge we felt we were acquiring or being exposed to was through the trans through the transfer of the experience we were having. So in that sense, that's how the project formalized. What we our intention was to uh, trans to transfer the experience we were having in that trip to a specific context where it was going to be presented where it was in, in Madrid. So to that, in the process of formalization, we took a hyper-realistic a hyper approach. So that is, we tried to in some way replicate a space that, uh, a space from Havana, but in Madrid. And let's not, come like the, there's a very uh, slight but important difference that we were not trying to open a Cuban barber shop or restaurant uh, or restaurant in Madrid. What we 
were trying to do was to take a piece of Havana and insert it in in Madrid, and and that implied a very like a rigorous, hyper realistic approach, which I will get into into now. So the project had several layers. On one side, it had like a layer of architecture. You know, when we got to Madrid, we had to construct the whole space, which included all the legal certificates and documentations that you would need to open to open a barber shop, restaurant in a house in in Havana. We had to do the adaptation of plugs. We induced humidity in the space. We brought, I don't know if like 50 kilograms of objects and materials from there. We changed the lights. We had to build tables, the whole signaletic and everything. We painted it. And then, uh, and then we had that, and then it, it happened in as well in a, in a house in Madrid, which is also an art space called El Cuarto Invitados. And that's where we sort of run the activity. At the same time, it did have, we did choose barber shops for, for several, for several reasons. On one side, they, uh, they happen in a house, so it implies the household. At the same time, it implies a form of income. And they're one of the most, uh, like one of the most uh, disseminated businesses in Cuba are barber shops. So we were looking at a place which is very, which is very ubiquitous. Like there are many, uh, to the point that when the uh, opening of the, uh, like the economic opening that took place in 2010, it was barber shops that were chosen as the business in which to implement, into in which to first implement this thing. At the same time, barber shops have a, like a very distinct social character and are very frequently, frequently used. So in this sense, we we were we were opening like we could say we were uh, uh, for one day. It took place one day, the 27th of December which is the day of the barbers in Cuba, we in Madrid. So we opened like a, we opened a business and we realized in the process that just having a barber shop where we had more free space wouldn't be enough. So we opened as well a restaurant and we collaborated with a person. So throughout an entire day, people could come. Uh, they would have to buy in, Q, in Cuban pesos. If they were foreigners, they would pay a different price. Uh, and they could c come and cut their hair. They could come and have lunch. They could come. So it was also very interesting how throughout the day everything went uh, went evolving. You know, it was like a, it would seem when you were there that you were really, really it was very well constructed, as if you were in another in another place. And uh, and apart from this, like more economic layer, you had then this like more performative layer, which we, in collaboration with Rodi and Oscarito, we managed to add it. We were the persons that were managing the place throughout the day. They were the owners of the place, and with whom we imagined both experts, one in 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 bar and restaurant hosting and the other one in in barber shop uh, like a, in barber shop and as well like a, in a more academic and social social way so they were holding out the the place and then when people would come throughout the day you would have like a whole there was a whole communication project in it which we did a whole newspaper as if it was from the day there and in that newspaper we were inserting actual stories from from original Cuban newspapers that had a lot to do with the different topics we were saying. There was a TV running with a whole, with a whole uh, like uh, program as if it was in, on a normal on a normal day. The whole imagery, the whole curation of objects. So it was like a very like exhaustive like uh, it was a very exhaustive project. But I think that uh, in that transfer from one place to another, we were able to like put forth some some uh, conclusions and observations which i think are like very very which are very colindant to the project of intelligencias colectivas we were ourselves in on one way we were able to observe like an like an economic an economic and uh, an economic and historical structure of how a society is is conformed you know like there were other ways of living like the economy you know like a sort of on of unlearned uh, capitalism, whereby the throughout the resources you have, you also adapt the skills you develop in order to implement them and to earn a living. This whole topic of the growth is very visible there through the reuse of materials, through the fight of programmed obsolescence, also the way that spaces are used, like um, spaces of learning and professionalization, how they're different in one context or or another became very visible. And even the, the like the more personal approach to spaces, which as we find in, for example, Madrid, more homo, they're being continuously homogenized 
in these spaces, which were still homes and at the same time more personal businesses, you still had a more like a you had more of of what uh, less divided all the these cross paths of society, you know. So these places were political, they were religious, they were social, and they were sort of the governed in a less regulatory way. They had their own schedules, their own forms. So. Uh, their, their forms of communications vary in according to the specifics. So they're almost all like site-specific running projects, you know, and, and so that is very related in a personal level to the persons uh, running it. At the same time, by doing this project, there were, we were also like, a, we were inserting ourselves in this legal question of how spaces are allowed to be used in determined, uh, in determined places, right? Like, uh, for example, in Madrid, you're not allowed to sell food on the street. You can't do like a ambulant vending, but in but in Cuba, for example, you can. Or in a home in Spain, like to change the license from one like a urban space to another, whether it's commercial or workshop or a, or a shelter, it's a, it's it's a very complicated process. So you don't have this like over regulation. For example, in Cuba, and this opens different possibilities in the ways you, the decisions you can take over your own personal space, the decisions you can take collectively over the shared public space, but at the same time, it also re at the it, overall it, it really determines how how a city and its and its citizens are circulating and making use of it. So that was very interesting to see how these over regulatory things, and I won't go much deeper into it, but the. But the complexities of like and the ups and downs that each each of the situations offers, you know. So mainly a conclusion of it was like that there's different ways of being organized as a society, and in a more continuously homogenized uh, like planet, the like Cuba in this sense I think does stand out that it has uh, particularities which were mentioned yesterday, and they, I, I think there are learnings to be extracted, and we every place has its. Uh, Good and uh, good and bad sides, to call it in a simple way. But I do think that it's a place where there's a lot to be learned, simply because of the way it's functioned and the way it's it's happening. You know, to to this, so different forms of consumption, different forms of use of materials, different forms of like as Orotha calls the socialization of technology, whereby and which Juanito mentioned yesterday with the example of the of the iPhone, like. Um, it's a, it's a very different sort of relationship with materials of opening, of dissecting it, of converting diff, uh, a part of a thing and opportunity in another place. So all these movements, I think, were are topics that came out through it. And I think that also shaped a lot the way in which we started to to look at um, to look at the project of inteligencias uh, colectivas there. And that sort of, as was mentioned yesterday with Guyen, when the conversation started and then the project um, the project happened, and then a year later, with the support of the Spanish embassy there and Acción Cultural here, we were able to we were able to go back again. And in that sense, there were three main goals we had for for that trip. Where one was identifying, like with the methodology we had done and with the dialogues we were having with with Guyen, like there was uh, three three main goals. Sort of this trip was a bit to lay the foundations. To continue working. So one was the topics of interest, another one was like agents of interest, and the other ones were spaces that were, could be relevant to the investigation in in different uh, in different aspects. So in this sense, like after living there, because it's a very there's a lot of topics you could go into. As I was, I tried to give a bit of a panorama with the with the barbershop project, but I mean, you do have to start somewhere and we did have the intention of centralizing, uh, of centralizing certain topics with the desire of working, of exploring this in more depth with the possibility of also, of also, uh, of also uh, opening them more afterwards. So in this sense, we tried to identify four topics which were broad, broad enough, but still narrow enough to be able to, to work with them. So the first um, the first topic was like habitability, and by habitability we were we were looking at sort of the the way people are using space in the city. So at both the domestic level with the whole like uh, 
like vertical in vertical ampliations that people do in their homes there or the vertical ampliations which also translates to the use of public space so for example you have people or some barber shops we saw happened at the at the sidewalk of the house at the sidewalk of the house so it's a way that suddenly the public space is being incorporated to a public activity at the same time it's used for social gatherings for for different for different encounter for social gatherings for political purposes for sports there's a lot like a, a lot of different use that the city is given in in Havana and that's sort of what we were trying one one of the topics we want to we want to be looking at at the same time in all these processes of course materials are materials are happening are being used and these relationships of course are very very relevant to to it then the second topic we have is mobility and mobility and i would say mobility and like circulation you know not mobility exclusively transport on uh, itself is a quite a big topic in the in the island the havana is a very spread and particularly in havana it's a very spread out city and there's normally a need to to cover quite large distances to go from one point to to another so in this sense with mobility we are looking at transport in the most strict sense of the word so like transport vehicles whether it's cycling cars also forms of transport right like how uh, uh, how car sharing how car sharing happens how different vehicles are intervened to serve different purposes um how uh, how also a form of transport can become also a, a selling stand so this brings us as well to like the the circulation of consumer goods and materials which for the embargo and different reasons have not always been easy so this sort of circulation of materials there happens in a in a way that i think differs to different contexts and it definitely uh, differs to to more to european society, current european societies and the way but at the same time with mobility we're also looking at a like also like the circulation of information so now th there is a greater access to to internet there but at the same time el paquete which is a form which is a form of accessing like uh, like information from the internet whereby you take a terabyte of information you go to a center and you take it and that's a way like weekly how information was being circulated in a very fast in a very fast way throughout the the entire island so when thinking of mobility and circulation or looking at transport as such but also looking at uh, how materials move around uh, around Cuba and specifically Havana but also how information is distributed and access to in in it and then um, the third topic we we're, we're, we're looking at is resilience or so resilience as an understanding as a sort of a strategies of durability you know like how different measures homes uh, industries take their different decisions to increase the their durability because of the, of the lack of materials there are of the lack of accessible resources and how these different strategies per, uh, permit persistence you know so like also very related to this is maintenance which is a very important part of of, of like of life there which is maintaining whether it comes to cars because there's no access anymore to spare which is a typical example there's no longer like access to spare parts because there are american cars from prior to the revolution how suddenly these have been completely mod uh, modified and intervened in order to be able in order to be able to con to be in continue in continued use and this is applies as well to like Riga, which is like a a, wash, a washing machine that had a fan from the Soviet Union, and the fan of the of the machine has been has been used in very different contexts. Whether it's in like uh, batidoras, sorry, I don't know how you say, like in batidoras or different applications. And there's a whole like movement of pieces and spare parts that are moving from one side to another to uh, to sustain the the necessary activities that those materials support, right? And then finally, which I think I'm with Vicente will be um, will will be one of the one of the upcoming sessions. So, like the emergency, uh, from my point of view, like you can look at it like is Cuba in a constant state of emergency, right? Because of the embargo and the hardships that has endured, and 
the embargo in the last decades has been very strongly economically and it's been material and immaterial in the sense that from the island, uh, economic transactions necessary to purchase goods for the islands have been frozen because they were going through channels where the United States has access to block it. And this applied to all sorts of technology, consumer, industrial goods. So it's debatable. I was speaking earlier to Juanito. It's debatable whether this could be considered a, 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 a situation of constant emergency, which I think is a topic that's arguable, but uh, I leave it there. And then, of course, you do have like the more, more, more uh, referred to emergencies like uh, hurricane, like hurricanes, which Cuba, for example, has a very, very good preve preventive, preventive like system and mobilization in the sense of of evacuating, of evacuating communities at very fast times, doing it in an ordered way, in a very strategic ways to avoid, for example, human casualties during the during these natural natural disasters. And then, of course, you have then these are more structural like emergencies we're talking about. But then, at the same time, of course, there are uh, personal and uh, industrial and more specific emergencies that attend to to other people. And I think that the that stu that studying this uh, this form of responses of resolving of solution more if resilience is more related to to durability. Emergency is more is is more focused on like the re, uh, on on the avoidance of crisis, you know, on and impeding the and impeding the the their impact. So these are sort of the four block of topics which we're going to be looking at and which throughout the four the three symposiums we will be we will be working at with different specialists, artists, urbanists, uh, historians, which will per be participating. And at the same time, we will be like um, we will be uh, producing content for the website, written video and stuff with different collaborations in order for this virtual space to be alive, so we can all all the group uh, continue adding content, but also have some uh, some uh, external perspectives to put uh, to add to add from their from their specialties, right? Then the the this is so this sort of comes out from the phase so from the phase one as a, the topics of interest, but then we also look in the trip at the spaces of interest. You know, so what we, what sort of spaces would we be looking at uh, when when go, when going back? You know, what we thought were relevant, and at the same time we saw like places of distribution, so places like markets, ports, more of production, like industries. But at the same time, personal workshops, car maintenance places, and different different like private businesses which are working specifically on fixing fish tanks, for example, or which are fixing cars. So this, but at the same time, also more educational level. We were like uh, so like like Uhai and La Fac, which of course we have mentioned, which are spaces that serve also for the distribution of contents, but also for like educational for educate for educational and pedagogical purposes then more like also more cultural projects like El Corredor de, de Linea, which is more like an emerging cultural project which is under development uh, taking place in the neighborhood of Belado and still open to see what's going to happen with that. So we sort of did a, a whole localization of different spaces sort of around this uh, these places where we could distribute contents we were producing, places we could investigate what we were investigating places where we could access students and professionals from this that were working in the same fields as ours and workshops and then finally the the third thing we want to do which i think it's the agents of of interest right so uh, which i think is sort of that sums it up with the, all of us that were meeting here so when we went there we did have to do a lot of perhaps less less fun but more um this fun, but also fundamental, which was build the human network of persons that were interested, that were looking at these topics, and that were willing to that were willing to engage in a project like this. So on Wednesday, we visited the Goethe Institute, the Spanish Embassy, La Fac, La Cujay. We had pending uh, a visit to to like uh, the office of the historiador. Then we also visited like uh, independent like uh, architecture studios, infrastudio, for example, 
Um, so we were also like sort of trying to get a, a brief panoramic because obviously 10 days allows you to go in depth to what you can go in depth. But um, but I mean, the idea was sort of to build this this network of interested, which I think is sort of derived into where we're, where we're now, into this conversation where we're, where we're all in. So yeah, the first trip was like at the end was a bit of a, well, this a scheme through these three things, obviously, like the depth you can get to, but thankfully we had Gu, Guillen there, who was very good, good guy the, in the time there. And well, these were the three things we lay, we laid down, we laid out there. And then the next steps come, the next steps coming up, which derived from there, and which is what we mentioned briefly yesterday, was the workshop and the mapping. So that is to go in there working with students to start feeding the the virtual space with the content and start you know building that archive of 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 a, of collective intelligences and uh, and mapping out as well the human network uh, behind it and then of course there's this virtual space which we've mentioned and all the collaborations that I mentioned earlier that are going to be th- that are going to be happening and and taking place I don't know if this is a bit of a very broad uh, and quick uh, summary of what it was. I don't know if anyone wants to ask any particular question or or make any particular appointment of anything I have said. I uh, want to say only one thing uh, that is only technical. I think like there were some uh, travels like, with the presentation in some spots. So we are going to upload the PDF in order that you is available for everyone to understand the topics. And they will be also uploaded in the website uh, or in the platform that, that we are creating. But we will uh, uh, send it to all of you and then put it online in order that it's available from, from later after the thing in order that you can go through. Yes, I, I have one question uh, about the um, how much improvisation is it when you went to Cuba and how much preparation was it like you know um, you need to prepare but on the other hand you need not to be too much prepared you know so just you have to 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 look for it and hunt it and maybe uh, so it's a bit of an improvisation versus a plan and what's the balance between the two. I think that uh, well, I think it depends on like in everywhere. It depends what you go to do, uh, like what you go to do. If you're gonna go to study grass, you go there and you sit down on the grass. You know, like so. It depends in how much, like in the amount of territory you want to cover, the persons that you're implying, and that sort of in this for this specific like case. Uh, I do think that, of course, there's a plan, and I think that, like, uh, it was like very, I don't know, Guyen was very supportive in in building this plan. But I also think that because of different, uh, for different questions, you do have to be, that you do have to go with certain flexibility. And I also think that that flexibility, well, in terms of transport, suddenly if you're displacing yourself from one place to another, maybe a problem arises, or or the weather, or Different different elements can bring. So I do think you do need to have a plan, and I think having a plan is great as a general structure. And I also, th- but I also think that it's a place which, for this specific uh, broad sort of field that we're looking at, uh, that you also do need to have flexibility because at the same time you may be headed to something, but you may come across something that uh, guides you to another direction, and that brings you to. To determine learnings and context or whatnot that may be um, that may be that may be you know maybe of greater interest. So I do think always with a plan, but at the same time I do also think that you do need to have some flexibility because there, it's so layered, it's so layered the amount of information there. But the, that uh, that uh, flexibility I think allows like uh, allows for a better for a better work to be done. But obviously with a general plan. And I think that, like, I don't know, with Guyen, with Joyce Helene, which I haven't met in person, but I'm sure that with a general plan as well, so people can organize their time, uh, the students know when they have to be somewhere. But at the same time, there, you do need to have, I think, a leeway to be able to, hey, if tomorrow we were going to go see this place, maybe today we were here working and we decide that we haven't been able to cover everything, so maybe we decide to come and 
continue working on this because otherwise we leave and we feel that our job has been a bit unfinished. So I do think that it's a place that calls for flexibility, but I'm always in favor of a plan. So the German plan and the Cuban flexibility. I think it sounds a good, like a good mix. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, sort of that. I think the German the German plan, the German plan with the local flexibility. Yeah, yeah. I don't know if anyone else has something to else to add or if you prefer we continue adding. Guyen, I don't know if you feel I've missed something or you would like to add. I I would say like because we are gonna go with Guyen now. Like and then he can do like also an introduction. I don't know, like from, from the side from the university or Fry, Fry University, uh, Professor Foss, or I don't know Lorena or Ruben want to comment or ask something. I can I can I can go for it. Um, well, basically, I mean, thanks so much. First of all, to all the people that has been working in in, in organizing these meetings. Um, and these sessions, and also it's incredible to see how um, we are coordinating this through different institutions, but also with people in in Cuba. I'm obviously excited to to go to there and and, and see in, in in the field how these uh, intelligencias colectivas uh, are happening. Uh, I'm just starting to remember some of my my, my field work in in. in in the in the side of disaster research and disaster impacts in, in Latin America and the Caribbean, and uh, I had a question that I, I I don't know if I can make it now or, um, but it, it was related to to this materiality of these collective intelligences, and this would be for the people of uh, Sohaus Lorenzo, or Juanito maybe can can address it. Um, are, are you collecting also other? Um, collective intelligences that are not physical, they are not material. Um, I, I don't know if you, you know what, what I mean. Yeah, 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 totally. And that's why, like, for example, when we were, like, um, when I was mentioning, for example, like the distribution of information, I don't know if you can consider that uh, mat that material, I don't know if you can consider that material, but that circulation, we consider it like the like more as a digital form of, of content, you know, and how it's circulated does involve certain material channels, but it does. And then at the same time, with another branch of Inteligencia Colectivas, we're working with, uh, with uh, Yaumara, which is a, co a colleague that lives in Madrid, and she used to form part of the Conjunto Folklorico Nacional from there. She's a dancer and an artist. And so we are working, we are working and looking at specifically at like the forms of oral of oral transmission. You know how all the all those learnings have been passed from generations to generations, and how they are transferred in a way that's not material. Actually, we're doing an experimental project of seeing how you could teach, for example, someone to dance rumba through written form. So we are do looking at transfers of information and. Uh, through orality or through practice or other forms like that and how that is getting and how that is happening but yeah we are like uh, looking at non-material non-material which are not maybe necessarily so evident always but they do but they do they do happen especially in more in more traditional ambits and their for the transfer of information that usually implies other channels than than like than physically evident ones. To add on on what Lorenzo was saying, uh, when we were there, and I think uh, Guillén or Jocelyn will be able to talk about this more in, into detail. But we got to know this. Um, there's there's different WhatsApp groups because of the scarcity that you can find in Cuba uh, with different things that. Uh, uh, serve as a way of sharing those those kind of materials and they're not uh, materials in the sense that they're things to build but the example that I, I really enjoyed getting to know was a whatsapp group to share medicine so for instance because of the scarcity maybe you can't get the medicine you need 
because they won't they don't sell it anymore there's this whatsapp group where you can ask other people hey i need ibuprofen or i need whatever medicine and someone in that whatsapp group might tell you i know someone that has i'll put you in contact with that person or maybe some person in the group has some and they will share the, those resources between each other so there's this specific whatsapp group called medicine in la habana or any other different group so it's really interesting how people are getting connected through the, the digital technologies now who share resources in a moment where there's scarcity of spe a, a specific thing so maybe or at least from my point of view that is a way inteligencias colectivas exists in a digital digital way not only in a physical way i don't know if this is an answer but i think it's interesting because it's talking about how people uh, get organized and get connected and so on in in a way where this uh, collective knowledge is is shared i would also like to add something i that i did like very much the question from Professor Van Rijs about how much improvisation and how much um, uh, we have to have a plan and how you cleared it. Lorenzo was very nice. We are now with Lorena working with our 15 students in the unit in the ITU, and we are doing a kind of very deep research. And actually, we are not yet there in about intelligence or about collectiveness. So we are researching a lot about what we are a technical university and our students they already have so many years of training so to say that um, they already have a plan for what they think about so we are researching a lot about architecture and different definitions like clima, cl clima architecture or vernacular architecture or local architecture or ecological or uh, massive etc so we are like working now to define and to make clear so we are having like preparing ourselves to, to landing there and kind of, um, yeah, this thing of, uh, for us, I think will be like a lot of improvisation there, but I'm also very, uh, how to say, very amazed about the idea that we will arrive there with a precise uh, way of looking that actually is not the same like the Zoo House, and we will start to find in collectiveness in places that maybe for you is like, hey guys, but this is not collective uh, enough. Or we will start to look for intelligence, places that um, that for you is like, no, but this, and I'm very uh, curious and looking forward to this point when we all there in Cuba start to work together, improvise together and start to talk about, um, but guys, this is, this is, too much, uh, this is too big or too small, and this is too material. This, I think, will be a very, very interesting point, a very moment in our study. Yes, thank you, Ruben. I think, like, only, only like, because since yesterday, like, uh, it's important that we understand that Intelligentes Colectivas is a network, and so House is like only the initiator, but there are more than eight individuals and institutions that they are developing this methodology and every time there is a new network, it defines the concepts and it defines what means collective intelligence. So what is interesting from this specific case of Cuba that there are like institutions and individuals from three different countries that they will be thinking what is intelligence collective in Cuba. So I think your perspective is not so there is never like this kind of uh, like what you are thinking is right and what we are thinking is wrong or the other way around like it's turned more like a bidirectional process that there is not about like what is good or what is bad. It's more like how we all together build a context and put together all the cards in order to create like a very specific uh, research and process, something like this. I would love like, I don't know if, like, if there's anything more to say. I'm more like trying to uh, keep the schedule on time. Uh, so and now I want to thank Professor Foss and Professor Van Riggs uh, to be here today with us. And I think like uh, that you need to leave a little bit early, but it's nice like uh, we give pass uh, to Guillen.
that is going to moderate this table. You're going to know some actors, like the first minutes that you are going to be with us, like that they are going to be also when we travel there. Uh, and maybe we can meet uh, more deep, but now you have the opportunity to hear them talking for the first time. Uh, and then start the discussion about Cuba. So, Guillén, whenever you want, if you want to start the table, I think you're... Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone here in the Mexican Embassy and the Department of Architecture. Uh, it's a good afternoon, so we're going to start our roundtable uh, to talk about uh, to talk about Havana. Normally, this kind of roundtable uh, is with academics, professor, but uh, in this case, we want to invite different kinds of exercises that we work in in the city. For that reason, we invite the first place to do an academic professor Lejeune Casanare, PhD. Uh, Dr. Casanare is uh, also a member of the non project and the is invited here to explain why it's doing no project collaborations with the state of London and other institutions here in Cuba. Guillen, Guillen, sorry, there is, there is something with a micro that from the computer we cannot hear anything. I'm sorry to I don't know if it's off. No. no. Yo sé, pero muy distante. Hola, yo, ¿eh? ¿Y ahora? Porque están guiando el micrófono. No, you are, you are using the microphone from the computer and not the other microphone. Maybe it's a setting on the call. ¿Y de mi lado? No, ok. Eh, apago el micrófono. Sí, eso fue lo que dije. No, I have the feeling that you, you in Google Meet, you are figuring the, the microphone of the computer instead of the external microphone. <laughs> No, no, we can continue the discussion. And if you, I don't know, Lorenzo, if you want to, to answer some questions that we were addressing before, yeah, what do you, yeah, so what were the last, the last question? Sorry. There were these two questions, like if it's physical, like intelligence collectivas, or, or these evidences, they can be they can be other way than physical that you already answered. And the last one were related to the how the topic and the new perspectives come into the project. Like remember saying, like they are exploring their own way. Well, yeah. Uh, well, um, to continue in line of what you were saying, like I think that. Um, that there is that when dif when you build different networks of people with different like uh, approaches, you do find that this collective intelligence can take different forms really when materializing it. Uh, in that sense, I think for me being working with the Almada is being very particular in that sense because you're more than a collective intelligence or something. You're talking about lear about more uh, immaterial learnings and how those uh, are transferred throughout time and how they get modified on the on the way, so suddenly we're working with someone related with with dance and uh, music, you know. And so I also think that when you come from different, uh, not only fields but places, context, and I don't know, I think it's also a matter of sensibilities, you know, which different sensibilities I think will place their eyes or be naturally more inclined towards towards different aspects, points, uh, in forms of looking. So I don't know. I also think that. Uh, the exchange between the students of La Cujai with the students coming from Berlin, I also think it's going to be very rich in that sense, you know, how how from abroad maybe, and it happens to all of us, uh, like you live somewhere and you get used to something that you don't, that it becomes sort of invisible and then someone comes from abroad and they tell you, hey, and then they suddenly, they shed light in another way of looking at the places where you're living. So I don't know, I think that everything is part like of a, 
like of a very good and I think that's why the idea of making it a bilateral exchange was fundamental was fundamental like for the for the project you know because I think that it's there's not only like a disciplinary in this case architecture approach but also a very subjective approach from your relationship with the territory you're visiting or a territory you inhabit so I don't know I think that it's a uh, that uh, overall that it depends when you're working on that it, it's endless you know like you can be looking at different things and uh, working with different persons and go through completely different paths. But I also think the diversity, even I'm, a, I, I'm not an architect, I studied political science and, uh, and history. And uh, I don't know, I also feel that the different, the different uh, disciplines and the different profiles of the group enriches the, especially the, the, the scope and the breadth we want to give to the, to the project. Yeah, yeah. Again, to add a bit uh, on what uh, Renzo was saying, I think what is interesting of the, of the project in, or what we think of intelligencias colectivas is something that I was uh, mentioning yesterday that has to do with how how the project is shifting or uh, is growing through the interaction with other agents. So the perspective of what Inteligencias Colectivas is in a particular place might change, not because the, the, what, what the core values or the core ideas of Inteligencias Colectivas are, but because in that specific place, what is interesting is something specific that is different than in another situation. I think that uh, the videos I shared yesterday from Ernesto Rosa might be pretty indicting towards what we think Inteligencias Colectivas can be in, in La Habana. Um, he, he's been de developing all, all these uh, theories, why not call them like that, that have to do with many of the things that Inteligencias has been interested in since the beginning. But probably through the interaction with uh, Teu and Kuhai and so on, the interest or maybe will shift or will grow or will transform itself definitely and we think that is part of the conversation when i was mentioning yesterday that design is good to be used but is also good to be thought about is really important because intelligencias colectivas is about discussing what design is in a, the reality we encounter in that specific moment so, for instance, in La Habana, we will be discussing of what design is in that specific context, how it's made, uh, uh, what different agents are involved, as Lorenzo was explaining uh, before, how materials are uh, moved from one place to another to be able to be used, how they are shifted from one use to another one, and so on. So, we think the conversation of what Inteligencias Colectivas might be, uh, as Rubén was saying, is part of the interest of the project. So it's about designing, and as I, I was explaining yesterday, co-designing, but is also a big part of thinking or co-thinking, as, as we were suggesting yesterday. So it will be a process where we have discussions on what is interesting and why something is interesting from the perspective of Inteligencias Colectivas, and hopefully it will broaden the way we think or we see what Inteligencias Colectivas might be in the future. That is how the project has come about until now, and hopefully it will continue growing because of that. I think that that's uh, one of the main ideas of the project, so what Ruben was suggesting is precisely one of the most important things uh, regarding the project. I don't know if uh, they fixed the problems, the technical problems in, uh, not yet. Okay. Did you? No, no, it's, no, it's not working. Okay, so, 
Maybe you, you need to clo come closer to the computer or something like this with the, your mask. I don't know, like, in order that we are able to hear to all of you. Or you disconnect the call and then enter again, because maybe it's a problem of the configuration. <laughs> ¿Me escuchan? ¿Me escuchan? Sí. ¿Me escuchan? Ahora sí. Ahora sí. Ok, perfecto. Pero a lo mejor okay. está cerca del ordenador o es el micrófono. ¿Tú me escuchas a mí, Chacón? Uh, perfecto. Ok, perfecto. Muy bien. We were preparing other set. Good morning, everyone. Good afternoon. Sorry for these technical issues, but uh, it's okay. So thanks, uh, Chagon and Lorenzo, for the first presentations and for this um, round of, of questions. So now we're going to start our round table about to, to talk about Havana. In the regular way, this kind of table used to be just with academics, but we want to, to make a different approach with invited different exercises that is taking place in the city those days. Uh, we invite Professor Joycelen Casanave, who is a uh, uh, PhD and um, professor of the Faculty of Architecture. But here we invite her as a member of the No Project, a collaboration project with the UCL of London and other uh, Cuban institutions to think about the future of the city in different topics. We also invited Robertico Ramos Mori, who is a designer, uh, a tattoo. Um, tattoo designer and is a member and um, founder of the La Marca Body Art um, Gallery, an interesting entrepreneur, responsible entrepreneur business who is uh, located in the historical center. I have uh, an interesting work with the community um, in this area. We also invited um, Ana Laura Escalona and Michelle, Michelle Chan Sanchez the, uh, from Acocam Project. Michelle is the coordinator of the project, and Ana Laura is collaborator of the same project. They're going to explain what they'll be doing uh, in those years. And um, finally, we invite uh, Fernando Martirena, who is an architect and founder of the Infra Studio. The idea of this um, round table is to talk about uh, Havana, um, the challenge, but also the potentiality that we have in the city from this different approach to understand how uh, with a different uh, perspective we are thinking and how we understand Havana. I want to invite you in one minute to present what you've uh, been doing uh, this year. The first moment I want to invite Professor Casanave to explain what is no project and what you've been doing this year. Hello everyone and nice to see you again today. <laughs> Uh, uh, to explain no project is too too long maybe. Then I, I I want to share some general ideas about this challenge and potentiality from the no project. No is a um, project that is a um, uh, hold in UCL London uh, uh, within the DPU and where is uh, participating eight countries from the south. And then Havana is one of the cities where, where we were uh, working. I'm one of the partnership uh, city within the project, partner city in Havana, uh, because it's a, a collaboration be between UCL and in this case, Kuhai and other institutions within the city. And this is part of the projects that are uh, uh, sharing by the uh, research and uh, action group, uh, urban research and action group in the Faculty of Architecture. And as the name say, it's a group that uh, is not only working in, on the research about the city, but also about the actions in order to know or in order to feed our research uh, about the different uh, urban situations in the city and how to do with that. And this is the main idea of our group, uh, work with the communities, work with the people uh, uh, in, and, uh, it or 
um, fit our work from the everyday life. One of the lines we uh, develop within the group is the transdisciplinary line in order to uh, uh, implement some tools and methods in general that allows us to uh, integrate not only uh, professional law knowledge or discipline uh, or knowledge from disciplines but knowledge from the everyday life knowledge from the communities knowledge from the people who is uh, trying to fit their needs in the everyday life and this is one of the uh, points that i think no and our research group have in common with this uh, collective intelligence and uh, in this case, um, No is working in uh, four urban situations. Alamar, that is a kind of new town uh, in the east part of the city. Uh, the bay, the area of the bay, that is uh, so around the bay, all the territories are, are around the bay. Uh, Centro Havana, especially Los Sitios, that is a central place in Havana that uh, maybe some of you are walking. And uh, the last uh, case is uh, Plaza de la Revolución, because it's one of the most aging places in the city, and we want to work with the uh, uh, elderly people. And uh, in this case, we are trying to incorporate these people in general, these communities, in researching how to fit their problems. In this, uh, I think this is one of the challenges we have in Havana, uh, precisely to include the people in the solutions we, we can do from the architecture and from the urbanism. Uh, and, uh, the potentialities are uh, exactly in what they do in their everyday life. What can, uh, what, what are they uh, developing in their everyday life in order to feed their necessities in general, their demands, and we we can see this every day. Uh, yesterday, with a student, we were discussing of the, our our meeting that uh, Cuba is one of the more resilient places. And during the crisis in the 90s, for example, we implemented some uh, ideas about how to move in the city. And then mobility is one of the uh, items we want to talk about in this uh, Inteligencias Colectiva. And precisely, we have this experience using the bicycle and using another means. And maybe the bicycle is not so common now, but we are trying to bring uh, again back to the life. And uh, uh, there are new ideas about how to move materials with uh, two uh, wheels uh, and a kind of different bike or how to move more people than one uh, biking but two in the back of a kind of a cyclo bus or something and uh, also we have uh, some experience about how to to grow in the city how to make in urban agriculture. Cuba is one of the most successful places where the urban agriculture were developed in the 90s. And then we can see how to uh, uh, change the, 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 place, the, the places without this uh, urban agriculture inside the cities. Then this is one of the challenge. And another big potentiality to face this challenge is that Cuba uh, have a kind of slow motion urbanism. And uh, that's, that's mean that uh, we are in a state of urbanism that is in the same state in the 60s or in the 70s. And that means we, we can do a kind of shortcut, a, a kind of uh, go without see what would be happening in the meantime uh, uh, with a, 
a learning from another experience, from European experience or from the other North uh, experience in the North or even in the South, and then implemented new ideas of how to, to do things with the collective experiences of the people from the everyday, everyday life of them, and then incorporated to the design of the city, to the design of the buildings, and etc. Then this is a great potentiality we have, and a challenge is how, how to include the people and then how to face this, uh, uh, these problems in the city in general, and then how to continue. Okay, I think I've uh, it's enough, <laughs> and we can we can talk a little bit more if you have question after the panel. So thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Casanave. I uh, want now Fernando Martirana explain from the perspectives of uh, of the of ar um, architect studio, architectural studio here in Havana. What the, what is the uh, the work with the city? Uh. So, hi everyone, uh, thanks uh, Guillén and Inteligencias Colectivas for the invitation. My name is Fernando Martirena. I'm a co-founder of an architecture studio, uh, an art, uh, that it's an independent practice that basically works for the private sector uh, of Havana. And also we have developed uh, during the last years uh, a, a series of uh, even research, but also theoretical and, and artistic speculations about the future of the city and also the actual condition. So I think that would be... Uh, okay. I want to introduce now Ana Laura Escalona and, and Michael, Michel, sorry, Michel Sanchez uh, for ACOCAM project. Hello, everyone. Thank you for the invitation. Um, I'm going to translate Michel's word. Bueno, gracias por la invitación. Eh, a ver, coordino un proyecto comunitario que nació como una iniciativa de autogestión en 2016, que su principal objetivo es el desarrollo integral de una comunidad en grandes condiciones de vulnerabilidad. So, he is the coordinator of uh, ACOCAN's project, who was, um, who started, which started in 2016, and uh, ACOCAN uh, was born in Los Positos, um, a needed community, in Havana, Marianao, and the main object or the main goal of the project is las primeras líneas de trabajo estaban enfocadas a, a reconocer el patrimonio cultural como una oportunidad para el desarrollo, partiendo okay. que la experiencia nace de la universidad como un proyecto de extensión. So at the beginning, the project was um, um, focused on revalue all the heritage that Los Positos have and uh, was part of an um, initiative of uh, San Jerónimo's University. Y actualmente eh, hemos crecido, digamos, a una visión más integral de poder incidir desde lo económico, lo ambiental y lo social en la transformación de una comunidad especial como es Los Positos. And so right now, uh, the project has grown and, and they are focused, we are focused on, sorry, I missed that okay. part. No, 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 a ver, en lo económico, en lo ambiental y en lo social. Oh, okay. Um, La dimensión integral de Agogan is now focused on an integral um, vision of the society and uh, is working with the agriculture, with social values, and urbanistic. Yeah. <laughs> eh. <laughs> eh. Yeah, okay. that's the, our minute. Ese es nuestro minuto. Yeah, yeah, I, think, yeah. I think we should stop. <laughs> so now Robertico is going to explain what is La Marca and how they operate in the historical center of Havana. I'm going to translate. Eh, buenos días, eh, mi nombre es Roberto Ramos, soy diseñador eh, y artista visual, eh, soy el responsable de la parte de cultura de estudio galería de La Marca, que llevamos seis años insertados en La Habana Vieja, no somos ninguno de La Habana Vieja, nos insertamos en ese espacio, y bueno, 
El objetivo principal que, tiene, que tenía en un inicio era... My name is Roberto Ramos. I am a designer. I'm a visual artist. Uh, we've been operating for six years in the historic in ha or Havana. We are not from or Havana, but we added there and we start to work in. And I am the responsible of culture of, of the of the of La Marca. Eh, nuestro objetivo primero cuando, cuando nos hicimos el estudio fue, que sigue siendo como el objetivo principal, es rescatar dentro de, la, de las artes visuales cubanas, dentro de la visualidad cubana, sí. el arte corporal, en especial el tatuaje, eh, eh, porque existe una legalidad de la actividad en Cuba que no es legal todavía. Our first uh, goal and our main goal, still being our main goal, is create, uh, put in value the the corporate art, the body art, the body art inside of the visual art in Cuba, and to create a legality for for them in the artistic manifestation here. Y la forma que encontramos, que hemos ido encontrando poco a poco, ha sido estableciendo sinergia con otras disciplinas de las artes visuales y relacionándonos de una manera armónica con la comunidad. Eh, real del espacio en el que estamos emplazados y una comunidad virtual también que se retroalimenta de todo lo que hacemos en, en redes sociales, etc. Eh, es un video para lo primero. Y la manera que encontramos. Ajá, and the way we find, and the way we find to, to create this, uh, this goal to, uh, to get the, that goal was uh, create connections with the different artistic manifestations, but also with the community that we'll be operating and also with the online community with the presence and activism in the social in the social network yeah okay so now i want to to start with the first question It's about uh, the what is this the the issues and tensions that you are working with uh, in your regular work with the community what is that problem that you find them and you've been focused on, on them i want to start with Akogan. Eh, a ver, estamos hablando de un tipo especial de ciudad que inicialmente nacen como ciudades espontáneas, tiene varias denominaciones, ciudad informal, eh, de Guipón, a ver, que tienen un grupo también de regularidades. A ver. So we are talking Acocán, it's based on Los Positos, a community that doesn't have a um, legal recognition and we, we can find different names for that like llega y pon, like I don't know how to translate, slum, and, well. Son ciudades o espacios urbanos que generalmente son vistos como marginales, pero más bien mm -hmm. me gusta decir que son marginados. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, usually the people who live there and the community in general is live a process of exclusion, and in Spanish um, we call it Uh, marginados, mm -hmm. there are people who are marginated. Hacia afuera de las oportunidades. Yeah. Eh, que tradicionalmente estos espacios no son vistos como lugares de, de, de crecimiento económico, mm -hmm. de, de inclusión, sino son mm -hmm. más bien rechazados, donde no hay políticas públicas, mm -hmm. digamos, bien focalizadas en su desarrollo. Usually people there cannot find economic uh, ways to subsist, to live, and they don't have the same opportunities that um, people who live in other parts of the city. Y que, por ejemplo, ahora mismo, en el periodo de este pandémico que estamos viviendo, ha, se han enfrentado a problemáticas muy particulares, como es el problema del acceso a la información, el hacinamiento, uh -huh. el acceso al agua, uh -huh. for al instance, empleo formal. For instance, during this time of pandemic, the access to water, to information, to legal and formal work uh, has been mm, tough, has been... Uh, y el acceso a los alimentos también. And the access to food, it's hard to find there. Pero parte um, de nuestro trabajo es identificar esa gran diversidad de oportunidades que existen en esos espacios, desde lo cultural. Creo que vamos a llegar ahí después. ¿no? Ya. So, ah, bueno. Sí, como oportunidades <risa> de, de desarrollo, ¿no? But the work of Agogan mm -hmm. it's find the potentialities and the ways to um, bring development to the community. Y que en realidad son una mezcla de, de muchas identidades de Cuba porque son comunidades que nacen de la inmigración. Mm -hmm. sí. No sé, ahí coexisten yes. muchas maneras de ser diferente que al final es riqueza. ¿no? Another characteristic of the community is that in that same place we can find uh, we can find a lot of 
um, different Cuban culture uh, because there are uh, migrations for other province of this um, country. So that's other issue, like a variety of interest and cultures and way of do things. Y donde las personas por sus situaciones críticas de vida están todo el tiempo innovando y creando y conectándose para poder llegar a ser, salir adelante, ¿no? Y poder vivir. So, um, due to this necessity of these hard conditions, people are all the time innovating and finding new ways to subsist, to live. Y identificar estas estrategias son and that's la one of the posibilidad things, de desarrollo, ¿no? And that's one of the things that ACOCAN see, seems like a potentiality to um, find that uh, way of doing, of that innovation that people have. have so. Y donde experiencias como la nuestra de trabajo mm -hmm. comunitario en asentamiento de este tipo puede convertirse en un laboratorio para identificar estrategias que sirvan <laughs> para las más de 100 comunidades, ¿no? Que, so, uh, que hay en La Habana de este tipo y en Cuba también. That's the other goal of ACOCAN. ACOCAN wants to be like a platform to um, systematize that uh, way of work with this type of community. Because it's not the only one in the city. We have, it's more than Los Positos. We have several communities with this characteristic in. It's interesting because Akokan is located in Marianao, who is in the is a municipality who is in, in the periphery, and they have a, um, a really interesting urban fabric because uh, they have this slum, but they have this area is more consolidated, consolidated with um, urban fabric, and that's a reality, and that's uh, interesting about to talk about the access to work, to food, information, form of jobs that this will be talked. This, they were be talking, but now in the historical center with a more, um, uh, we can say, formal um, conditions with uh, a lot of uh, more heritage. We're talking about uh, the buildings and more social cultural project because of the work of the um, office of the historian. What is we doing? What uh, in what was focused La Marca there was working with the community? Pues nosotros estamos insertados en una zona que, aunque es urbana, también tiene unas mismas una características bastante, hay bastante estratificación de, de relaciones, inclusive económicas, ¿no? La zona es turística, pero la gente diario vive en un nivel bastante separado de lo que pasa. Proyectos generalmente de tipo como el de nosotros son de los que vienen, se insertan en el lugar, se capitalizan y se llevan como lo que, o sea, lo que ganan y se lo llevan y nunca invierten en, el, en la zona. It, it's interesting because uh, uh, in the area that we are located, it's a touristic area, but you can find the, like a two phases, like a duality, be, because uh, there is a tourism, but there, there also there are the, the needs of the community. The project like, like us, of entrepreneurs, normally come here, put uh, the business and take off the money to take it to other, to other place. That's the normal way. Nosotros desde el principio eh, sí teníamos claro que, o sea, que más que un estudio de tatuajes nos interesaba tener también una galería, o sea, un espacio que, en el que el tatuaje estuviera aislado y pudiera funcionar eh, para, para sostener todo lo que, lo que tenemos como proyecto inicial, que era la galería, y que el espacio fuera abierto en el cual la gente pudiera eh, entrar, salir, estar. En nuestro caso, tuvimos... In our case, we have clear that we want to have uh, a place for the tattoo, the tattoo studio, but also as a gallery, when the place that we can work with the community, the community can go inside, separated these two activities. Eh, y bueno, como somos una, somos, la mayoría somos personas jóvenes insertadas en el... <laughs> Eh, somos bastante, o sea, somos, un, somos, somos, somos unos personajes bastante típicos que aparecimos en esa zona y sobre todo hemos tenido muy buena acogida con los niños del barrio, son siempre que nos asocian con las cosas que ellos ven en un momento como que, que están fuera de la zona, son las que asocian con, con gente, o sea, para ellos es muy raro ver gente que se dedica a dibujar y dibujando, eh, o sea, pueden ganar dinero, ¿no? Eh, um... It's for the for the for the child for the children of the community. It's really weird to see people with a to to, to see drawing everywhere with the with the community, and that create like a connection with them that comes comes to the to the Lamarca to to draw and play and play with us. 
Y a partir de esa misma relación de... Y a partir de esa misma relación de, o sea, de, de dibujar y conversar con ellos, uno termina como, como o sea, se, se terminan conviviendo, se terminan convirtiendo como, los, o sea, son nuestros vecinos, ¿no? Y al final termina, o sea, enredándote en la vida de ellos también y detectando un montón de problemas que tienen. De, o sea, de formación, de educación, de cosas que a veces que la escuela no puede, no puede suplir o que las mismas madres, porque son mujeres que decidieron parir jóvenes, bueno, en fin, hay un montón de historias ahí, al final no terminan so, convirtiéndose, somos todos como los tíos, un montón de chiquillos ahí de... <risa> <laughs> so there is a lot of need that uh, the family cannot supply, and we try to to create this uh, different different environment that we are like the aunt and, and uncle of the old children of the of the community. Y bueno, nuestra disciplina se ha basado sobre todo en la en crearles en en la en, en crear en educarlos en la capacidad de crear cosas con las manos ellos mismos que o sea que se van a solucionar problemas con las manos que no se frustren porque estamos en una o sea, una ahora todos los niños cuando quieren hacer una cosa parece que se frustran muy rápido cuando están acostumbrados a los programas de televisión que todos hacen cinco minutos y se frustran muy rápido entonces somos más de, de enseñarles que las cosas tienen proceso que que todo tiene solución que si te rompes zapatos también se puede solucionar que no es necesariamente todo el tiempo comprar uno nuevo no o sea es una cosa pedagógica educativa sobre todo con ellos y con los padres al punto que a veces los padres vienen a ver nosotros y decir habla con él porque a mí no me hace caso o sea. uh, we, we, we've been focused on the idea of the creativity and to in, more important in the process because right now the children is really easy that they do um, uh, not connect with uh, this it's more fast people want to to to, to see the something done and we are more focused in how to the process to do things and also to think uh, when something is broken like a shoes you don't have to 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 buy a new one you, you can you can fix it. And sometimes the the parent of the child come here and talk to them because we don't hear us. Ahora estamos eh, eh, la relación con los adultos siempre tiene que ver a raíz de con, o sea, los problemas que siempre tienen es que los niños siempre o, los, o las personas sus hijos jóvenes eh, se quieren tatuar y vienen a hablar con nosotros para que para que se tatúe con nosotros ya que ya que se van a tatuar, que se tatúen con nosotros, entonces ellos nos agradecen mucho que nosotros seamos la gente que digamos, no, no te puedes tatuar porque, porque no tienes legado, porque... Y el público adolescente sobre todo se nos ha quedado un poco cojo, pero bueno, en eso hemos encontrado, es un público bastante complicado, pero estamos trabajando, nosotros que trabajamos de manera independiente, no tenemos ningún tipo de, de problema en relacionarnos con instituciones o sea, culturales que, están, que, que, que existen en la Habana Vieja, que ya están bastante... Entonces estamos trabajando ahora con la gente del centro de este adolescente y con ellos estamos pinchando ahí y más o menos vamos detectando. O sea, estamos muy acostumbrados a que la, a, o sea, los adolescentes están acostumbrados como le digan lo que hay que hacer y ese centro está creado más para que ellos generen los proyectos. Estamos ahora haciéndolo como unos tallecitos para que ellos aprendan a, a soltar, ¿sí? a, a proponer. So in the case of the age, yeah, in the age of the of the tattoos, sometimes the parents brings the um the children so to, 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 to talk with us and we explain that they, they don't have the age to, to make a, a tattoo uh, and they understand. We are now working with the, with the teenagers. It is more important to work. So it's important and tough to talk, uh, work with them. In our case, we are independent, but we don't have any problem to work with the institution. We actually collaborate with some cultural institution here in the historical center. And now we are working with the AMAS project, a project for adolescents of the, for teenagers here in the in the historical center and how to work with them in the idea of the um, create things in, in the create yeah create in the thinking on the in the in the process to talk yeah perfect so now i want to make a, a professor casanave send me a message i we said slum when we were talking about uh, los posito it's not a slum it's an informal settlements because they have a legal reconnect they don't yeah, it's a, it's a kind of a, it's a kind of a, um, precision uh, made of some specialists on that from Belgium and from United, uh, United Kingdom, and then they were they are specialists on that, and it's, it's in this case is informal settlement. Uh, what it means. Because they have a, a different, it's not like, like a slum in the south, and it has the several legal recognition. They even have a, a physicians, they even have a, some uh, bodegas. But uh, anyway, 
it's not important just to to to, to tell us the same language to the people who are not uh, speaking in Spanish. Thank you. Sorry. Thank you, Professor Casanova. So now we see we see right now the conditions in the in the some problems in Los Positos. We saw some problems in the historical center, like the two different areas of the city. One, Fernando talked uh, talk us about the experience of the um, infra seeing the city is more global. I imagine right now the work that you do with the uh, with the urban garden to think about other problems of the city from the visions of the infra studio. So from, from Infra Studio, we don't have and we don't want an academic approach uh, to the problems of the city. And we are more related, that's why we have been more related with our contemporary art. And uh, the art biennials uh, of Havana have been a, an amazing platform to put on the table these uh, huge problems that have been uh, experienced in, in Havana. And uh, I can talk about uh, briefly two projects we had done. The first one was in 2015. And it was about uh, exposing uh, the big, uh, the, I mean, the huge deterioration that it's facing the city because it's been decades of non-repairing the city, but also uh, the absence of the independent architect as a, as a figure, as an important figure in the city. And uh, because basically everything uh, that, uh, or 99% of what it's built in the city, it's built by the government, but the government don't have the, cannot solve the problem by its own. And it's been like that for the last decades. And uh, this absence of this uh, role, this, this figure, it's really important because there's a relation between the deterioration of the city and the, and the emptiness of the role, historical role of the architect. And what we did in this biennial, is to make it physical, uh, to make the uh, this intervene this space to uh, to the people to get here and understand the emptiness. So the experience this big void, uh, and also understanding that uh, independent architecture it's a crucial uh, element to to renovate or to re rethink the city in a sense. And then in 2019 we were working. Uh, in some speculations over the city with uh, Alberto Calach and Maria Calach uh, from Mexico and about how just changing the gardens of Havana, you can change the whole city. So it's a, it's a kind of a proposition about the whole green infrastructure and how this can bring not just climatic changes, but all on the city or sustainability and all these kind of things that uh, everyone talks about, but also really political changes, really aesthetical, but also social ch changes. And we also had the opportunity, uh, in a sense, to work with the government for this, um, for some projects in the city, but then none of these projects uh, came out and, and worked. And the outcome was uh, another installation in the in the vinyl. So uh, in our case, just the, the fiction, it's the only device we have been uh, using uh, in these years. And we think uh, in some sense, fiction can change reality uh, by the imagination. So by just imagining what can be done. And also all these kind of uh, events have this uh, capability to, to achieve this. So I can. So now I want to, to finish the, this round table with a question about opportunity. We talk about problems, we talk about what has happened, what is the situation in, the, in this different community and in Havana in general. So what is that opportunity that Havana has right now? So I want to start with Professor Casanave. I know you explained some. I know you explained some of them in your introduction presentation, but uh, like in general, to point uh, some opportunity that you don't want to, to pass. Okay, sorry. Um, some minutes ago, I didn't realize that it was only the presentation. I I thought was also the the opportunities and the challenges and yeah, and I think I think I talked a little bit about it. Uh, I think Havana has a lot of opportunities. And as I said yesterday, you have to focus in the different urban situations we have. As a, a, our colleague explained, it's one thing, that what is happening in the informal settlements and what is happening in the center of, of the city. And even in the center of the city, you can find different things in the main arterias and 
in the inner uh, core of the different neighborhoods. Then I think uh, one of the uh, main opportunity is that the uh, experiences people have have uh, from the everyday life, uh, wh how they fit their needs and how they do things even when they don't know how to do it. Uh, and we have a lot of uh, uh, previous experiences from the different crises we have and we I explained it uh, just some minutes ago about it. And uh, another opportunity is to join in and discuss and find solutions from uh, that we can share in the whole city and we can put in another level of uh, technical issues that can answer this. And this uh, could be a, a big opportunity and a, a, as well a big challenge. And the main opportunity is to, to have a, a kind of shortcuts uh, a kind, uh, for example, in mobility, we we can uh, through it out these uh, phases of having sustainable mobility with a, a big uh, a metro or, or different things, and we could have a, a, a city of places and uh, movement at the same time, and then. Uh, enhance the walkability and at the same time make easier the people to move around the city and we can do a kind of shortcut avoiding cars that we don't have for a long time and uh, avoiding uh, things that can make a, a, a big pollution in the city or other things and we can have a shortcut in another areas and how to make people participate in the uh, discussions of the city and make pol policies that can involve them, not only asking them how to do it, but asking the, uh, or not, but involve them when you are doing something. Then this is a kind of shortcut that uh, we can make in the city. and. This is our main idea from our research group and uh, a, a great thing we can do from the university because the university have the, the history of uh, uh, doing in the cities, doing in the country in general since 1960s. Then, so this is my point of view. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Casanova. So now, for close the, this this part of the of the roundtable, to finish with the the main opportunity that you have from or the different perspectives. Okay. Yo creo que una de las principales oportunidades, aparte del reconocimiento, por ejemplo, del patrimonio y de identidad, no, de esos espacios, es poder transitar a una ciudad sostenible, partiendo que son comunidades que tienen una huella ecológica muy baja con respecto a otras. Y eso hace muy factible poder asumir nuevas tecnologías, nuevas maneras de vivir que sean, digamos, eh, viables desde el punto de vista ambiental y social. Okay. Por ahí va la cosa. Uh, mm, we should start it with the heritage and value the heritage, but also uh, to find um, innovative ways of create a sustainability society because uh, we start with knowing that this is a community that have a low, um, help me with this in this translation, please. <laughs> Una huella baja, the a slow food, small print, yeah, footprint, but in the environment, you know, <laughs> small environmental footprint or something. <laughs> That's it. So the uh, Havana had a, a, a huge boom, a construction boom uh, from the 30s, 40s, and 50s, and then it was suddenly stopped in the 60s. So uh, when you have a construction process that it's stopped in the most saturated uh, or an extreme point, then you have a huge vacuum, a huge silence. And this silence in construction 
it's been bad for the city because it has created a great deterioration of the building itself. But also, uh, it can create the opportunity of not making the same mistakes that other cities has made in its ambition of modernization itself. So we are in a really peculiar, hyper-specific uh, condition where you can, uh, let's say, start from scratch and then reinvent uh, uh, urban politics, but also you can reinvent uh, a new approach to the city itself. We have this opportunity. If we take it or not, then it comes to uh, another issue. But uh, I think Cuba, in a metaphorical sense, it's a kind of a des dessert to be populated because uh, you can do whatever you want, in a sense, because you don't have so many the, the weight of the burden of the modernization history in, in the city. So it's uh, an open plan, in a sense. Eh, yo creo que la mayor oportunidad que tenemos nosotros es, eh, al estar enclavado en La Habana Vieja, es eh, habernos podido desarrollar en un sistema de, democrático y, y horizontal y ver que eso, así funciona ese barrio, por problemas que tiene La Habana Vieja, se funciona, o sea, potenciar ese tipo de relación. La mayor oportunidad que tenemos es en el democrático y horizontal proceso que tenemos en Habana, para ver that work y el potencial de uh, that process. So now I want to invite, invite Christina, who is uh, with us, to start the, um, to help me with the moder moderate this last part. And we open to the questions uh, we have in online and also with our students in the Faculty of Architecture of Havana. Hello, Christina. Welcome. Hello, Guillem. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much uh, for inviting me also to the second part. I have been listening like uh, your presentations uh, from the beginning with Lorenzo and I am like amazed <laughs> um, learning and I want to learn more about Cuba and, 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 and Havana. Um, before we start, we have some questions also from the public, but I would like to, to address a small question also to our public from my side or a small note. Um, uh, I have been listening also what uh, Professor Casanova was saying about the, the resilience that uh, and, and Lorenzo also talked about that, how the uh, Cuban society deal with emergencies. Um, and I have somehow the feeling that uh, maybe this is the fact of these uh, human networks and peer-to-peer -peer, uh, practices uh, that, that the society is showing. And, and I have the feeling that this is the, the center of the commons. In European cities, we are always like trying and talking about the, the commons. And I have the feeling that in Cuba, you, you, you realize it um, in this amazing way. And I have the feeling that uh, um, um, I mean, we would, we would need to learn from this. Um, uh, I mean, living in, in our environments from this side of the Atlantic. Um, and the second point that I would like also to, to address, it is that I would like you maybe to, to comment is these strong bonds that uh, you see, or I was reading about Cuba uh, that has between the city and the countryside and this this kind of um, maybe it's because of the embargo that uh, there are higher they, they have understood these interdependencies and these interconnections that uh, the urban environments has with have to with the countryside and uh, relating with the products um, and yeah I would like to hear your opinion about this too. Maybe we start with uh, Professor Casanova. Sorry, I didn't understand the last part, but uh, you mean about the differences in, in the urban environment, the rural environment? I, I don't understand, sorry. I have the feeling that there is a, a kind of very deep uh, connection between the cities, the urban centers in Cuba and the countryside regarding the, the, the products or the food production and distribution. And maybe this has to do also with the embargo uh, and the scars of the, of the 
products, but I would like to hear more on that. Yes, yes. Okay. Uh, so this is not a, I'm not very, uh, I have not a lot of information. I, I think uh, Poa is one of the most urbanized countries in the, in the South. We have a lot of countryside, but a lot of people, more than 80% of the people live in cities. And there was a, a huge uh, kind of um, development uh, around the 60s and 70s in the countryside. And then while Havana didn't grow from a long time, uh, the other cities grow uh, three or four times what they uh, did before the 1950s. Then I think uh, there is a kind of a mixed situation in all the country. But even though we depend on productions from the countryside, in a sense, and then it's a problem how to grow the different products. Even though the, problem, the problems with the, with the fuel in the 90s and even now, make difficult to, to bring the food uh, to the cities. And then during the 90s, we developed a kind of urban agriculture inside the cities. And even we are continuously uh, working on that and there is uh, gardens, uh, productive gardens and other experiences. Maybe a little bit disappearing, but uh, at the same time, is very common. In these pandemic uh, situations, we realize that again people growing in their own uh, gardens, roofed, uh, terraces, uh, balconies, etc. And uh, so, but it is not enough in my, uh, from my point of view. I think we have a lot of to do about it. And we have a lot of knowledge we have to apply. Uh, on that, and at the same time, we have a lot of knowledge in the people that can grow in their own houses to incorporate to the science and then make it better for everyone. And at the other question, I just remember, sorry, sorry I focused on that, and then I, I forgot the other one. This was not as so much as a question, but uh, more as a point um, discussing about the disasters and, and the resilience of the of the city. Um, I have the feeling that this is because of the of the human networks and how people have learned to to communicate and work with each other. This 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 kind of peer to peer practices. That is the, the center of commons that here in the cities, um, yeah, in Europe, we are like trying to implement. Yeah, we, we have a kind of uh, living between commons. <laughs> we, we are living between commons in a sense. Then our neighbors can, uh, can see our kids. When my kids were uh, very, very small. I was really. Uh, um, I was good in in. They can go to the school alone, and they have a kind of a, a look at them from the community. And this is in this way in all the sense. So the people can talk. The people can share things. The people can ask the neighbor. Anyway, they. Contemporary uh, world has changed a little bit these uh, practices. Sometimes you can find in the centers of the city, here in Havana, in Bedado, even in uh, old Havana, uh, uh, things that are not uh, this kind of uh, common sharing. I mean, it's different now. Anyway, in the experiences of informal settlements, maybe this is much more uh, uh, 
important for the people. And this is very good. This is one of the tradition maybe uh, he was uh, um, talking about because there the people can uh, talk. We have the experiences in, in Los Sitios where the people uh, under uh, an emergency or, or, or under an emergency, they can uh, ask the people come to my house and leave your house because maybe the roof is not that good. Or maybe they can go to, to a neighbor to sleep with them because uh, it's a big uh, 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 storm or something like that. Then in the poorest areas, maybe there are more share uh, uh, experiences for the normal life. And we can learn for, from that. And we can incorporate uh, to our uh, uh, life in general and to our contemporary life. And I think in a sense uh, the academia uh, should learn from that in how to develop the communities, how to make collective places, how to make uh, spaces where students can stay and then uh, uh, share the kitchen or the common spaces, or how can we invent a kind of different projects for the cities and making different. And in this case, we have to learn from these communities. We have to learn, even here in Cuba, from these experiences in the uh, different places around the country. I don't know if I can follow your questions. Thank you. Yes, more than enough. And I have the feeling that these are also this kind of immaterial um, aspect that uh, it was addressed in the beginning no? of, the, of, the, of the presentation. So what you can map uh, besides of the, the material aspect or the design. And for me, this is uh, super amazing. Um, I, we have some questions from YouTube uh, listeners. Um, that, uh, and then uh, actually, Bouyen can also address to Akokan to explain their project as well. Um, regarding, I think, uh, agriculture. Um, what do you think we answer? We read them all together. Thank you, Christina. Uh, now, uh, to, to keep with the same slide with the first questions, I want to uh, explain one of the projects they are implementing in this moment is a nature garden, how they are with, with neighbor creating like the local urban agriculture. Um, they are now creating also like a collaboration with the specialists, but also give you tools and, and help them. A ver, desde Acocan eh, hemos intentado apoyar la producción local de alimentos, digamos, con un, una meta del autoabastecimiento de diferentes recursos que ahora mismo son escasos o de difícil acceso para este tipo de comunidad. Por sus altos precios. Agogan is supporting the local production of uh, food that right now are expensive um, in the market. So we're Agogan is supporting. Y también por la necesidad de, de poder complementar la dieta porque estamos hablando de una comunidad que no tiene en su totalidad el acceso a los alimentos subsidiados que se ofrecen, por ejemplo, por la bodega. No? And also as a way to support the diet of people, because we are talking about, uh, well, I, I hope, or I don't know if you know about the rational book that we have in Cuba, the system. We have a <laughs> rational book where people can buy by um, very um, cheap products like rice, and beans, but in this community, with the informa um, informal situation and the legality, and that is not possible. So they they don't have that help. Y a través de una iniciativa que le hemos puesto red de patio solidario, hemos conectado cerca de 58 eh, familias que tienen interés en producir eh, alimentos saludables en la comunidad. So we have created a network 
that uh, brings uh, um, five, um, 58 <laughs> families that are interested in product and grow their own food. Pero ha sido una experiencia yo creo que muy positiva para la comunidad porque no solamente es intentar tener más acceso a los alimentos y también fomentar una alimentación saludable, ¿no? una educación eh, sobre la alimentación, sino esto cómo integrar a través de la producción local de alimentos a personas vulnerables como las mujeres, las personas racializadas, las personas que tienen algún tipo de discapacidad. It's not only about production. It's also about a healthy way of eat, and um, we are very happy because we are uh, we can integrate our um, networking uh, women. That um, it's one of the more vulnerable vulnerability or vulnerable persons, women, <laughs> and. Well, they are the head of this networking, of this network. También tenemos un, digamos, un potencial porque estamos hablando de una comunidad migrante. Muchas personas han venido del, del campo busca, en busca de oportunidades en la ciudad y hay muchos saberes en estas personas en cuanto a la agricultura, en cuanto a la, a la agrobiodiversidad. Y, por ejemplo, es muy difícil en, en La Habana, en la zona céntrica, encontrarse, por ejemplo, guapén, con, es una fruta muy típica del oriente del país y en los pocitos hay de todo, desde el tostón a la banera a la oriental, ¿no? Por ejemplo. So, one of the pot potentialities that we have um, find in this project or in this initiative is that we have valued the knowledge of the people who comes from other province or other part of the country and in los pocitos you can find a fruit which is called wapen that comes from the west, uh, the west yeah, I think so, the Oriente, del Oriente, yeah, uh, the west from the country, and you can find it there, in Los Pasitos. Y también eh, proponer una visión de que cultivar también mejora el ambiente, eh, el espacio de la ciudad, como un, también un lugar de encuentro social, ¿no? Sí. Okay. Eh, como un espacio también de encuentro, de las personas, un espacio de, de arte, de, que tenga muchos beneficios, no solamente el alimento, ¿no? sino también el uso de plantas medicinales, plantas religiosas, ornamentales. Por ejemplo, ahora tenemos un festival que se va a desarrollar del 15 al 20, que aquí tenemos a su coordinadora, donde tenemos diseñado una ruta, que es la Ruta Verde, uh -huh. donde se va a mostrar a, a la ciudad esta experiencia, pero también en el futuro se puede convertir en una ruta turística, una experiencia que puede valorizar estos espacios también con, con otros ingresos, ¿no? Para las familias. A ver si me acuerdo. Well, uh, we have um, to one of the intention of the project is also um, to promote um, different knowledge with the how to grow not only um, a food, uh, it's also how to use it in a healthy way and with like. Um, uh, Medic plantas medicinales, sorry, I get in blank <laughs> with the English. Uh, medicinal plants, because people knows about um, knows about it a lot in the community. And other thing that um, the project has developed is um, la ruta verde, the green route that in our festival that we are going to have next week we are started this and it's a way to bring people from the city to know these gardens and these patios and it's a way a way to create also um, tourists local tourism in the in the community because they are going to know in this route how people are Mm, doing their own local products and their food and they are going to know how women are working in the patios and with the mm, food. <laughs> y esa concepción de la solidaridad es, es también no solamente una producción hacia lo interno de la familia, sino hacia la visión de comunidad. Por ejemplo, hay un caso, un ejemplo muy lindo, mm -hmm que ahora se está extendiendo en la comunidad, que es la siembra de una variedad específica de eh, habichuela que se llama bondadosa que está produciendo por varios meses, eh, y entonces la hemos usado como cerca viva, como en la perimetral, y las personas 
afuera en la calle pueden abastecerse de habichuelas. Entonces todas las mañanas ve a los niños y a las familias recogiendo habichuelas de manera gratuita y eso tiene doble sentido. Compartir con la comunidad y también evitar el robo de, de, de las producciones de cada uno de los dos espacios. Y embellece también la comunidad. Sí, yes. so, one of the main um, principles of this project um, uh, is how to be more solidarity. It's not only um, the production of local food for the family, it's also for the community. And one of the um, experience, um, recent experience that it's beautiful is that we are, <laughs> I don't know how to say habichuelas in English, habichuelas, <laughs> please. Well, we they have growth. Uh huh. And well, it's it's a vegetable that it's green and has been inside habichuelas, <laughs> and uh, it has been grown in a yard and uh, in a fence. And children go uh, in the morning to pick it up and go in and bring it to their families. It's for the community, and you can pick it there. And we have videos of that, it's beautiful. And yes. And yeah, it's the, uh, the double uh, purpose of the project. Not only um, eat and be, uh, and be a production, it's also solidarity and how to think in the others and how to um, create our food, not only my food, I don't know, it's not only for the family who is growing um, that food, it's for the community, I think, Nosotros you get it. De cultivando bienestar, ¿no? como que al final es eso, bienestar, it's una cosa integral. Well being growing. <laughs> okay, so, Cristina, I think you have, okay, I think you have a, a question. Yes, I have a I have a question, I guess it's for uh, Fernando and Robertico. Um, uh, someone from the, our listener from YouTube is asking, uh, what is the spectrum of work that the professionals in, in urban design and architecture are, can, can realize after graduating in Cuba? And what are the processes of, of uh, space planning? Are there competitions? Um, or it's uh, their public um, like calls for the city. So th that's that's a really uh, tricky question because uh, architecture as a as a private profession it, it was forbidden in 1963. So architecture has only uh, belonged to, to the state and the state uh, as a centralized government uh, focus on big projects, which I think it's good, but small projects have been left, uh, left over. And, uh, but then there was a, 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 let's say, a big change in the approach of economy. Uh, and over 2011, uh, the private economy uh, started to emerge and then a, a new client started to emerge, but there was a need and not so one who could solve that problem. And then there was a, a really uh, unique and let's say interesting response of, okay, I'm an architect, I was graduated by the Faculty of Architecture, I can design, but I don't have a legal frame to do it. So uh, you don't have, you have all the legal restrictions but at the same time, you have a client who's asking you to do that. So in, in my case, for example, I started my studio when I was in, in, in fifth year of school, of, of school. And the thing is that if my title doesn't work, my experience is not important. And then uh, the, the plans that I'm going to do, they don't uh, worth nothing in terms of legal. So it's really easy to have a private studio. And actually, there's no restrictions to do it. And also, of course, I'm talking from my point of view, uh, maybe uh, the professors or all the people can have a, a different approach, which can be really interesting. Uh, but uh, basically, a, like architects as a private practice don't exist, then um, paradoxical, you have a great freedom 
in the way we approach design because we don't have uh, like big urban, uh, let's say, not urban, but architectural regulations. Also, the kind of the taxes are like really uh, crazy. So there's a, you have to invent yourself and you have to invent the, the, the profession itself. And I, I personally think that a condition like Cuba, there's a hyper specific condition, should never be a justification or something bad. An opportunity to do something new. And uh, in, in our case, in Infra Studio, we created a fiction. I mean, having a studio that no one recognizes is just a fiction. But when a fiction, like, for example, Jorge Luis Borges, or a lot of people have talked about it, uh, or religion itself, like uh, how fiction can really uh, change reality, in a sense. And in our case, it's been a really fragmental, really, uh, like, from a really small scale, but then when you start to replicate these fictions, then you will have uh, a city that it's basically changing, not in terms of legal terms, but in terms of physical terms, by the action of small architecture offices. And now we are having a, a dialogue with institutions to, because the, there should be a, a change of the, of the work uh, law, and then architecture should be implemented as a legal uh, practice but even though if it is not implemented as a legal practice in the new law then architecture will uh, happen in any way so in informal way and i think maybe it can be an interesting thing to to understand architecture in a totally different approach so and also in our terms i mean in our office we have been really related with uh, literature and with uh, contemporary uh, visual arts and we have expanded uh, our practice to for example we created a let's say it's small editorial where we do uh, uh, books, uh, handmade books uh, related with uh, I know, music or, or whatever we like. And, and none of this is, uh, uh, has a legal frame at all. It's, it's just you have to invent uh, yourself in this kind of, and then maybe there's some consequence. There's, there's not. I, mean, I, I don't know in, in that uh, terms. Maybe we are kind of naive. Uh, but then talking about, I, I want to finish with the construction itself. So for you to kind of understand the situation of how to build in Cuba, uh, we have a, um, a license for decorator for parties, uh, which is the only license that can be understood as space, but also all our projects should be uh, signed as an architect for the community, which is uh, the architect uh, licensed by the government to, to sign these plans. But also the construction, there are many things that you have to understand. And one is uncertainty. It's a fact that it's immense. And in, for example, in our case, we are not interested in designing complete buildings. We're just interested in design spatial strategies and also spatial concepts that can adapt to different conditions. And when I'm talking about that, you cannot predict what's going to happen in the market. And also, a scarcity is not related with having less material. It's also related that you don't know which materials you will gonna have in the process of construction. So, for example, we are not interested in materials. We are not interested in in, in elements of architecture or structure. Uh, and so, we can design a, a house in brick, and then we can turn it to uh, reinforced concrete, or I mean, whatever. So, we we have a really precise uh, obsessions related with the um, uh, theory of architecture, but also spatial uh, conditions of architecture. Uh, and then we, you, in, the other, in all the other uh, layers of construction, then you have to adapt. You have to have like an open script. Uh, and you, from my point of view, good architecture can only survive this harsh condition by having a really strong uh, introduction, a, a really strong first idea. Uh, yeah, but I don't think if I uh, responded in a, in a good sense. Thank you so much. You have responded in an amazing way. I like this idea of architecture as a practice of resistance. So I have a last question to Roberto, and we finish the, the debate. Christina, if you're okay with that. Uh, this question is from, um, from Cuba. And, he said, assuming that the core of each society is the person, the habitant, how much do they educate these people to teach them to need, communicate, create, develop? I want to Roberto uh, answer because he talked about that in, 
in his presentation is a ten en cuenta importancia de las personas con la capacidad cuánto uno puede buscar a estas personas en la idea de la necesidad de comunicar crear y desarrollar yo creo que lo, lo, lo imagínate tú eso, eso es vital y creo que hay una falta de, de educación cívica grande en, en Cuba con el tema o sea no sabemos participar y sabemos o sea para nosotros participar es estar y no es realmente ser, ser participar y eso lleva a trabajar el poder de mi experiencia. Mi experiencia ha sido a partir de, o sea, de, de intentar detectar cuáles son las dinámicas de esos grupos humanos y a partir de ahí intentar, o sea, poner un problema que yo a veces detecto como, como gente externo de, dentro de esa comunidad y en realidad a partir de, de ese punto terminamos encontrando realmente cuál es el problema que hay y a partir de ahí entre todos. O sea, de, de diferentes maneras la gente al final termina participando, ¿no? El que menos participa a veces es el que termina diciendo, o sea, es muy... Pero bueno, es vital, ¿no? <laughs> so, um, yeah, in our case, I, we think that Cuba, we don't have a lot of uh, ideas of participate. Participate is not only be there; it's like uh, how to to be part of, to be part of that. We have a civil uh, civic conscience of that. In our in our case, we focus in the idea of understand what is the dynamic of this group of people, of this community, and in that context we insert our uh, our topics that we want to, to discuss. Eso parte también de la, y, y con un poco con lo, con lo que le preguntaban a, a Fernando también sobre la, o sea, la disciplina de diseñar, o sea, uno está preparado para, o sea, diseño es una disciplina que se se desarrolla a partir de un problema concreto, ¿no? Y como mismo tú puedes diseñar, diseñar una mesa por, a partir de la necesidad de tener un, poner un plato en un lugar, uno también termina diseñando eh, o sea, políticas y grupos, de, o sea, diseñando dinámicas de trabajo también. O sea, diseño me ha servido mucho para eso. Esta pregunta conectando con la pregunta que dijo Fernando, la idea de que los diseños responden a problemas específicos, o que sea, tú diseñas una mesa con una específica condición, that also you can design a create a specific dynamic of this specific process design help me to 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 create uh, this kind of, of dynamic so i think we finished with this answer i want to give you the word to to chacon thank you everyone thank you christina for your amazing uh, work today thank you Guillermo. and thank you christina thank you very much so we are closing this uh, the second day from the first session. You don't hear me? Ah, yes. So we are closing now, like the, the second day of the first session. Thank you again to all the institutions that have been made this possible. Um, and also to all the speakers today, to Lorenzo, to Joyce Helene, to Fernando, uh, Robertico, Michel, and Ana Laura. Um, uh, I want you to invite to participate in this process in the way you want. The platform cuba.inteligenciascolectivas.org will be available soon, very soon, and then is the possibility to participate through that, like in a lot of debates, like creating content and also moderating it. And I want you all to invite uh, to the next session that we, the second session, that we are going to have like some inputs, and it's going to be the 12th of January and the 13th of January uh, in the same uh, time as these two days. So wait for all of you there. Thank you very much. Thank you and see you there. Thank you.